my name is Stefan Kesting. I've been doing martial arts for 40 years. I've been doing judo and jiu-jitsu for more than 30 years. I got my black belt in 2006. And I have been a fairly vocal advocate, if you want to call it, of coronavirus. In the sense that I'm saying that coronavirus is a real thing. That coronavirus was actually something that we in the community need to worry about. And I'm going to start by trying to answer the most frequently asked question that I get now, and then I'm going to try and give you a bit of the state of the union of coronavirus in jiu-jitsu as I see it. All this is as I see it, right? I'm, opinions may differ. I've got pretty good reasons for my opinions, and I'm going to go into why I've got those reasons. So the question I get most often is, hey, Stefan, I live in XYZ. It, everybody I know is back to training. Is it safe to go back to training. So, this is not an easy question to answer because it's a nuanced question. First of all, there is no completely safe. There is no completely safe. If you go hide in your closet or under your bed, that is more safe than going out and training and partying, right? We can agree that those are the extremes. If you, if you stay at home the whole time, only do skip the dishes, never leave the house, you will be more safe from coronavirus. If you're out there training and going to open mats at three different clubs and going partying on the weekends at the bar, you are in the high risk group for coronavirus. So there is no completely safe. There's only gradations of safe. That being said, you gotta look at some other factors to decide where you want to fit on the safety spectrum. Number one, how old are you? The older you get, the more dangerous it is for you. If, if you're 50 plus, you better be careful. The odds of dying are not real high, but they start increasing. And the other thing that people aren't considering here, by and large, is the long-term effects of a serious case of COVID. We're talking brain problems, heart problems, lung problems. And if you live in a place where you don't have socialized medicine, it's very likely that COVID is going to be considered a pre-existing condition, which could screw up your healthcare coverage for the rest of your life or for at least a long time. These are questions that are not yet answered. I'm seeing numbers all over the place, but for people who've been in the hospital with COVID, the number of them who have long lasting effects, some variation of the long hauler syndrome is pretty high. So the older you are, the less risks you should take. If you are fat, if you are diabetic, if you are immunocompromised, if you are not healthy, you should take less risks. If someone in your family is fat, diabetic, immunocompromised, or very young, you should probably take less risks. The effects of this on infants aren't known. Not very many infants have died. I personally wouldn't take the risk. If your parents are old, fat, immunocompromised, you get the drift, and you're seeing them, you've got to be more careful. And if you care about other members in society, because we don't stratify people by age, right? If you're 20 years old and training in jiu-jitsu, but you're taking the bus driven by a 50-year-old bus driver, and sitting next to you is the 60-year-old woman who goes and works at the old folks' home where 80-year-olds are, we don't stratify. We lump all those ages together. And the more responsible you feel for taking care of other people in society, the less risks you should take. The other thing you have to look at is how many, how much risk awareness, risk averseness, and risk mitigation is the club doing? Is it business as usual? Is it everybody gets to train, open mats, yay, everybody train with everybody? I would say that's a very dangerous situation. Is the club doing things like contact tracing? Is the thing, club doing things like uh, training pods, where you're training in small groups? Is the club doing things like banning open mats where people come from other schools? Is a club doing things like really having increased the amount of ventilation coming into the club to carry out potential aerosols? The more risk mitigation the club is doing, the safer it is. So where are you on that spectrum? The other thing to consider isn't to do with a club, isn't to do with you, it's how prevalent is corona in your village, in your county, in your state, in your province, in your region. You can't just take a look at infection numbers. 
Infection numbers go up and down depending on how much testing there is. The best number that we're using to get a sense of our numbers going up, are the true numbers going up or are the true numbers going down, is the percent positivity rate. With a little bit of digging in most places now, you can Google percent positivity rate Tampa, Florida. Percent positivity rate Greater Berlin Region, Germany. And you'll get a number, you'll get a number. It's like 1% of all tests done were positive. 5% of all tests done were positive. 20% of all tests done were positive. The greater the number of positive tests, likely the more corona there is in society. So that's something I'm looking at really carefully. Is what is the percent positivity and has it been trending upwards or trending downwards? Obviously things like hospitalizations is a more accurate indicator of how bad corona is in your town and deaths is even better, but those lag. Those lag by a couple of weeks. So it's not a good measure of what's going on right now. The best measure that we have for getting a sense of where we're at right now in any given place with all the measures going on is infection positivity rate. So you gotta look at all of those. Personally, uh, the infection positivity rate where I'm living, it's about 1%, but it's going up. Sorry for the harsh cut, guys. I uh, filmed the main video about a week ago. I'm just releasing it now. And currently where I live, we're now up to 2.9%, which has got implications for the risks I'm willing to take. So you really got to keep an eye on these things. They change very quickly. Uh, I am actually taking a fair amount of precautions. I'm a first responder. So I'm coming in contact with crew, my crew. I'm coming in contact with the public. I'm coming in contact with some older people. I do not want to spread it to them. I'm very much erring on the side of caution. I wear a mask out in public. 20% to protect me, 80% to protect other people. I avoid places where mask wearing is not frequent. I went into Lordco, an auto parts store. Nobody was wearing a mask. I'm not going back to Lordco. I went to a supermarket, a certain chain of supermarkets. They were handing out masks at the door. You had to wear a mask to go in. Okay, I don't think that that mask protects me, but the fact that everyone else is wearing a mask protects me because their aerosols aren't getting ejected as far. The science on this is pretty incontrovertible. So a lot of it really depends on where your risk tolerance is at, where the, what risk you're willing to take on behalf of other people. Are you willing to put your parents at risk? Are you willing to put your family at risk? Are you willing to put people you don't know at risk? Now, if the answer to those is no, doesn't mean that you don't train. It just means you train differently. And we'll get to that in a minute. It also depends on what precautions the club that you're training at is, is taking. On my podcast recently, I've gone quite a few times into depth about why conspiracy thinking is so rampant in the jiu-jitsu community. Why there are so many people who are going, you know, COVID is fake, or COVID is real, but it's no deadlier than the flu, or COVID is super real, but everyone's going to get it eventually, so we should all just train. There's a real tendency in the jiu-jitsu community to pick the interpretation of all the potential interpretations that are out there floating around that allows them to train, and especially instructors to keep on instructing, keep their schools open. And it's totally understandable for two reasons. Number one, their livelihoods depend on it. Like their schools will legitimately close and schools have legitimately closed because they ran out of students, they ran out of money, their county, their city, their state, their province, their country said, shut it down. And they didn't give the financial support that that club needed to keep on going. So instructors are legitimately panicking. That is the first reason. The second reason is that there's so much misinformation going around. When you, when you look at somebody, and typically it's on the other side of the political spectrum, but we're just talking about COVID here, and you go, how can that guy be so stupid? Some of you are watching and listening to this right now going, how can testing be so stupid? There's a study here in March that proves that the fatality rate of this is much, much, much less than the flu. Or I saw on Fox News that, that the survivability rate of this is 99.9996 or something like that. How can testing be so stupid? How can he not know this? The reason your instructor or your, the club that you're talking about doesn't know this is because they don't see it. The, the movie, The Social Dilemma, that came out recently, it's an amazing movie, makes the really good point that we are being presented with different sets of facts 
depending on what we want to see. The facts themselves coming our way are different. The goal, most people get their news through social media. Sad but true. Most people are regurgitating what they're reading on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and whatever other social media platform that they're on. Those social media platforms want to keep you on that social media platform. If they show you stuff that pisses you off, and another social media platform is showing stuff that's keeping you, you're going to go from the one that's pissing you off to the one that's telling you what you want to hear. Therefore, we end up with a situation where there's siloing. Like you're in this little rabbit hole, and that's all that your feed is hitting you with. Thus, you're going, you see this politically. You see people going like, Biden is clearly, absolutely a shill of the Ukrainians. It's so obvious. And then other people are going, Trump is so clearly in the pocket of the Russians. How can they not see this? The answer is, they don't see it. It's not presented to them. One of the examples in the Social Dilemma documentary on Netflix, which again, I cannot recommend highly enough, is what if Wikipedia was individualized? What if you, when you went to Wikipedia, it gave you one answer, your friend one answer, and me one answer? We would be screwed because we couldn't agree on anything. What if I went to Wikipedia to find out the age of the Earth, and I got the answer 4.5 billion years, but somebody else is a creationist, and when they go to Wikipedia, they get the age 6,000 years. That's functionally what's happening with information about COVID. So how do we navigate this? How do we figure out what the real data is? It's really tricky. My answer, but it doesn't work for everybody, is to go to the original scientific studies and read the original scientific studies not what the media and not what bloggers and not what your friend on Facebook is saying about those studies. Read the actual studies. I've seen examples where a study said A, then it went to one site, and now that study says B. It went to another site, and now that study says C. And when it gets to the final one, it's thrown back at me. Well, this study showed this. It's actually F. It is so far removed from the original study, it's insane. And also, Keep in mind, there are so many studies out there right now. Some of them are flawed. This is what happens. I've done science. I've screwed up experiments. And it's really only through the review process and seeing if it, that study can be replicated that we get to something approximating the truth, where the results begin to converge in on something that is probably true. So saying, you know, if, if, if people are saying the infection fatality rate is 0.5% or 1% or 1.2% and then somebody else comes out and says the infection fatality rate is 0.000001% your response should not be they lied look at this scientist here he proved he proved that they're lying to you no your response should be isn't that interesting maybe that one guy has got an agenda maybe that one guy missed five decimal points on his calculation. Maybe that one guy took a super biased uh, sample of data. Maybe that one guy just totally screwed up, dropped the ball. Maybe that one guy just got really weird results that one time. Science isn't science until it's replicated. Right? If I do a study showing cold fusion, I remember cold fusion. One group came out with results showing that cold fusion happened. Nobody else could replicate that study. This is a problem. As of right now, there's still no cold fusion. I want to say this is 30 years later. Had that study been replicated by other groups, in other labs, by other universities, we'd be living in a totally different world right now. I wish cold fusion was true. I, I wanted to believe that it was true, but it wasn't. So it's not a very good answer to, to say, go read the scientific literature, because it is, it's dense. It is written in a certain uh, language. You need to understand certain statistical terms to, to be able to evaluate how significant or how real the results are. To understand how likely you could have gotten those same results by chance. And you have to look at studies that are done by different people, in different labs, in different areas, in different countries, by different reporting systems. Let's say that the US health reporting system is either biased high or low, right? Maybe they missed a whole bunch of coronavirus deaths. 
but maybe the Belgian system. I don't know anything about the Belgian system. Maybe the Belgian system is really good because it's a centralized data collecting system and all the data is collected the same way and goes into the same database. You've got to take a look at both countries because any one country can skew high, can skew low. Incidentally, it does seem that the infection fatality rate is somewhere in the 0.5 to 1%. That does seem to be where it's converging. This is good news. Originally, it was much higher. The early reports were like 3, 5, 6%. Yes, this is the results coming out of Milan and China in the early days of this infection, back when only really sick people got tested, only really sick people went to the hospital, people had no idea how to treat it, treatment options were limited. Your odds of getting it, and the hospitals were overrun, your odds of dying when you got COVID were much higher then. And some of that's a statistical artifact too, maybe quite a lot of it. So the infection fatality rate has come down. This is good news. It's good news. It allows us to do things like have training pods. It allows us to accept a small amount of risk in one part of our life and then try to be fairly safe in the rest of our lives. That's another thing. If you're going to an open, if you're going to a gym where the guy running the gym is a mask denier and allows open mats, you're not training with the average population there, right? Let's say you're going to a gym, the guy's a mask denier, you've got open mats, you've got a bunch of guys coming in, and the infection positivity rate in society in general is 3%. By training in that population of guys who tend to be mask deniers, who are not taking any precautions, who are probably out partying on the weekend, who are more likely than not to say this is all some bullshit plan, you know, that some variation of the Chinese created this to implant a microchip in your head, and besides, it's not actually real, and it's fake, and this is just a power grab by the New World Order. We've all heard stuff like that. Uh, they're actually more likely to be engaging in risky behavior in the rest of their life. So, if you go to the club where they're taking precautions, and they're doing outdoor training, and they're doing training pods, and they're contact tracing, and they're increasing the ventilation, that group of people you're training with is inherently safer. Which kind of brings me to the point of risk. It's not an all or nothing thing. If you decide to do something that's more risky in your life, you dial down the risk in the rest of your life. Right? If I've heard of big wave surfers, an incredibly dangerous thing. Big wave surfers who are like surfing these 60 foot waves, but when they get behind the wheel of a car, they're driving like a little old lady. Because if they die, they want to die on the water. They don't want to die in a car accident. So they're minimizing the risk in the rest of their lives to do the more dangerous things because that's what they enjoy. So if you're going to train, let's say you, you get a bunch of friends together. You get four friends together and you cut a deal with the owner of the school that you used to train at and you go, look, we know times are tough. We take this COVID thing seriously. I, I know opinions may differ. Can we get in here? Can we keep on paying our dues? And can we train from 10 to 11 on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, just by ourselves with our little pod. If he says yes, you have increased your risk somewhat by training in close proximity with four people, right? Four other people. Hopefully those four people are taking precautions. Hopefully those four people are now wearing masks, maybe N95s or KN95s when they go into the store. Hopefully they're not partying. Hopefully they're not hanging out in large groups on Thanksgiving. Hopefully they're not going to large bar mitzvahs or birthdays or whatever, and they're minimizing the risk in the rest of their lives. So in this one area of their life, they can increase the risk. They're not blanket accepting risk all over the place on behalf of other people. So to wrap up, mostly I'm not addressing school owners. Many school owners have made up their minds already. I'd say at least half of them, in North America anyway, are carrying on as if there's nothing wrong, as if COVID never happened, as if the actions that they and their students take don't affect anybody else. I contend that they do. Then of the remaining half, as is a very rough guess, some of them are taking precautions and some of them are closed. And my heart breaks for the ones that are closed. My advice for the school owners is try to make COVID safety a feature, not a bug, right? I, I'm pretty sure that there will be room in your town to say we are the most COVID conscious club in town. We have increased our ventilation by this. We limit class sizes to this. We have training pods. 
You have to train with the same four people every time or you can't come. We don't have open mats. And put this on the front page of your website. Don't hide it. Embrace the, the fact that you're taking precautions and you will attract back some of the people who are like, man, this scene sucks. I know that if I was looking to train at a new place, I would only be training at places who did all that and more and contact tracing and sanitizing the mats and discouraging people who are busy, uh, you know, it's now pivoted from declaring that the earth is flat to saying that this virus is no worse than the flu. I would, I would not allow those people to train. And I would only train at places where those people were discouraged from attending because they're not going to be safe in the rest of their life. But really, the people I'm really talking to are the jiu-jitsu practitioners. Realistically, I've already driven off the COVID deniers, the COVID minimizers, the conspiracy theorists. They're probably not watching me anymore, and they're probably not listening to this this far, and they've already posted their thing like, What about Sweden? Or, no, it's no worse than the flu, or go hide in your closet. Yeah, uh, they're already gone. So I'm presuming that I'm talking to the people who think this is real and are confused and don't know what to do. In general, I mean, if you're in New Zealand right now, go train. If you're in China right now, if you're in Wuhan, go train. It's gone. It's eradicated, right? If you're in a place with great contact tracing and infection positivity rate of 0.01, Go train. Go do things normally. If you're kind of in that 1% to 10%, well, that's too high, 1% to 4% positivity rate, maybe, and you're willing to take a lot of risk, you're willing to increase the amount of risk that you take and the amount of risk that you give to other people, you're accepting risk on behalf of other people, then try to limit it to training pods, try to limit it to small groups, try to only train with people who are conscientious in the rest of their lives. If you don't have a gym, if you don't have a home gym, if you don't have some mats, then try and cut a deal with the school that you normally train at. Try and cut a deal to go in and train during off hours if you can. Train early, train in the middle of the day, train late. Uh, avoid the places where it's business as normal. My, my final plea here really is on behalf of the sport. Uh, I know that there have been a bunch of super spreader events associated with jiu-jitsu clubs, both where I live and in other places, and there's a ton that don't make the news. But you know who is paying attention? The health authorities. If you don't, if you like jiu-jitsu the way it is, not regulated, if you like jiu-jitsu kind of in the chaotic anarchy or libertarian approach where you can teach whatever you want and you can teach whatever you want and you can have do this and I can do that, the way to get regulated is by having a whole bunch of super spreader events that end up costing the state or the health authorities a ton of money. If you put a bunch of people into the hospital because of a super spreader event at a club, somebody's got to pay for that, ultimately probably the taxpayer in one way, shape, or form, and you're going to bring the wrath of God down on jiu-jitsu clubs in general. When you think of, you know, at sort of the simplest there is that they just close them all together and start fining people and start opening snitch lines, all of which has happened in different jurisdictions. None of which anybody wants to see, but it's the natural consequence of people carrying on as if there's nothing wrong, as if this whole thing has been made up by the world, as if this whole thing has been made up in Belgium, in France, in Germany, in Italy, in China, in Canada, in the United States, in Mexico, in Brazil. Like The whole world has come up with this conspiracy to kill jiu-jitsu. That's obviously not what's happening. The, uh, the nightmare scenario is imagine the person you hate most in the jiu-jitsu world running the government organization that regulates your jiu-jitsu school. That's kind of what you have to think of. If we don't regulate this ourselves, we don't have a bunch of good examples in the community, we're like, yes, officer, we are training, but as you can see, the, uh, the state guidelines say no groups larger than 10 people, and you see our class is nine people and an instructor, and the instructor is wearing a mask. And then separated by 50 feet on the other side of the mat in a different room with the windows open is another group of 10 people. If we're not doing that, if some health inspector walks in and sees 30 people in a giant free-for-all, it's 
in the short term, the school's going to get shut down, the instructors are going to get fined, and it's going to be bad for everybody, not to mention the various risks that have been incurred. And in the medium to long term, we're going to end up with a sport that's way more regulated than we all like. And uh, if, if the idea of, if you're, if you're willing to risk coronavirus for yourself, and you're willing to risk passing it on to others, maybe the idea of the sport being regulated by the person that you hate most in your jurisdiction, maybe that's enough to, uh, to drive you. Sorry to be a downer. I wish this frickin' thing would go away. I cannot wait for a vaccine. Recently, there have been a whole bunch of setbacks on the vaccine front, as there usually is when things get rushed. I think when you throw a million scientists against a problem, we will end up with solutions. We have reduced the lethality of this thing with treatments already. I'm sure those are going to continue to get better. I'm sure we're going to figure out better methods to not have blanket lockdowns and blanket quarantines. We'll be able to have localized shutdowns. And with better contact tracing, we'll be able to say, okay, you 40 people, you, know, you need to stay indoors for five days as opposed to like the whole city stay indoors for months. We will get better at dealing with this. It's going to be another little while. I hope your jiu-jitsu training is going as well as it possibly can. And I've put a whole ton of resources on my YouTube channel, on my podcast, and on my website to help you get through this time and get more information about COVID. All right, guys. Take care. Mm-hmm.